Lord have mercy. Remember your red bandana. We got to stay on it. Stay with it. All right. Let's go to the Lord. I know some are still giving at the kiosk. That's fine. But if you'll stand with me, we're going to read. And our scriptures is found, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. And while you're standing, I want to greet all of our guests. We're so glad for each and every one of you that are here. Thank you for being here. And Jim and Amanda Lakes, good to have y'all. Good to see you. And thank you for being here. They've, they're return guests. And we're great. We love all guests. But people who come back a second time, we especially like them. Wow. Good to see everybody. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6, and then we're going to Acts chapter 4, and we'll read verse 31. Zechariah 4, 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. What I want us to notice here is he answered and spake unto me. This is the word of the Lord unto Dallas First Church. Or put your name in there. And he's saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. All right, Acts chapter 4. And, boy, I'd like to read from 8 to 31, but I'm just going to read 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the Word of God with boldness. Wow. So he told Zerubbabel, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by His Spirit. And that was the Lord. And the Bible says, when they had prayed, the place was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they were overwhelmed and spoke the Word of God with boldness. My message today is one that I hope will bring enlightenment to our hearts and the reason why some struggle in living is because they've never learned how to surrender to God. See, it's when you surrender everything you are, everything you have, everything you've got, when you give that to Him, that's when His Spirit takes over. So we're going to talk about surrender today. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Touch this people today. Touch our hearts. Let your power and your spirit be in this place. Strong and amazing. In Jesus' name. And somebody shout amen. amen. Bless you. You may be seated. We have a, a power-filled church. And I want it to be a grace-filled church. Power and grace go hand in hand. It's the power of God that delivers. But it's His grace that we need in this house to where anybody can find Him. Anybody can come to Him. This, this church is for whosoever will. Black, white, red, yellow, tan, brown, polka dotted, green. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your background, where you're from, what you've done, who you did it with. If it was last night or this morning, God loves you. And God cares about you. And this church loves you. And it's also a prayer-filled church. 
It's a prayer-filled church. Now, y'all know me by now. There's times I'll pause for a response. So it's a power-filled church, a grace-filled church, and a prayer-filled church. And four things that the church should be doing is going. The church should not be just sequestered behind four walls. We should not just be doing our life for Christ here. But we've got to go. As Vanessa said on the screen, we've got to get out. We've got to go take this message to everyone. And we've got to go teach. See, that's why when people come to God, they need to be taught the Word of God. And some people are weak in living for God because they've never been instructed. They've never been taught. So it's go and teach. And then we're a baptizing church. And people need to be baptized. That's the washing away of the sin. The blood of Jesus is applied in the water, in water baptism. I don't know how it works, but it's when... The baptizer and the baptizer, or whoever, whatever you want to call that person, when they are baptized, it's just regular water from the waterworks of Dallas. But when you say, in the name of Jesus, it's fulfilling Old Testament, and it's obeying New Testament, and something happens. And then you're filled with that blessed Holy Ghost. Wow. And then we are to observe the commandments. Those four things are listed in Matthew 28, starting at verse 19. And so we as a church fulfill that. And it's what an opportunity that we have right now to celebrate who Jesus is. We're not come to church to celebrate me. We're not here at church today to celebrate you. But we are here today to celebrate Jesus Christ. I, I can't save you. No one else in here can save you. Only Jesus can. And so when we come to church, the worship, that's an, an experience it encourages us, it lifts us, and it shows us how big God is and how little we are and how much we literally need Him. So God is helping us, and I'm grateful. He's building us. He's raising us. And so... The message that I'm preaching today is more than a classroom environment. It's more than just a gathering of information that goes into our minds. This is the Word of God. And the Word of God is powerful. The words of this Bible, they are powerful powerful. There is power in His Word to fulfill His promise. And what God has promised, He will do when we obey His Word. And so His Word becomes life to all that will walk in it. And so I want to give God praise for that. I want to give God worship for that. In our text, this is the Word of God to us. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by His Spirit, saith the Lord. And when we pray, I'm not talking about God is good, God is great, let us thank Him for our food. I'm not talking about now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to... Wow. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a real 
conversation with God. That's heartfelt. A real conversation of repentance. And God, I need you. And I depend on you. And I've got to have you. And I'm looking for you. So I'm asking all of us, how is your prayer life? How is your prayer life? Can you pray? Do you know how to pray? Can you pray out loud? Would it be awkward to you right now if I were to call your name and ask you to stand and pray out loud for all of us? Boy, you ought to see the nervous looks I'm getting right now. Again, be not afraid. It is I. I'm not going to call on you right now. <laughs> but in the Bible, there are some prayer guides. In the Bible, there are prayer plans. And twice in the last four weeks, I've taught you about what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. I call it the Disciples' Prayer. And Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. And He goes to, and we ought to pray that. And we ought to thank God that He's our Father. And that we have a heavenly Father. And we have somebody that watches out for us like a Father. And it's our Father. We're not alone. We're part of a family, an army, a church, a group. We're not alone. It's a heavenly Father. And so we're thanking God for that relationship and we're praising God for that relationship and for what He has done for us. And so you go on and you pray that. Another plan is, and I preached on it a couple of Sundays ago, the tabernacle prayer, where you start with praise and you start by giving God glory. But then you go through that first veil and you're into what we call the tabernacle. It's a large tent with no ceiling. And in the Old Testament, that was where you first came by that brazen altar. The brazen altar was where the sacrifices were made. And the ox and the ram and the lamb, the turtle doves and the such. It was bloody, it was gory. And this is where the fire was and it was a blood-bought fire and the sacrifice was offered right here the blood was taken that symbolizes the cross of Jesus Christ and so when you come to Jesus this is repentance and Lord the sacrifice you have made it for me you made it where I wouldn't have to so I claim that and then the Labor of water where you wash and you reflect through the washing. And that's baptism. And then you step past the second veil. And now you're in the tent within the tent. And it has a ceiling to it. And there's the candlestick and the showbread and the altar of incense. And all those things mean something. You can go to our website and get those prayer guides. And it, it will lead you through that. I don't have time to go through all of it today or I'm going to take up all my time. But we need to pray. We need to seek God. And it's, it's, it can't be just a weekly event at church. Now right there would have been a good time to say yes. It's got to be more than just coming to church on Sunday. It's got to become a lifestyle. My message today is about surrender. And we've got to surrender our whole life, our whole being. Everything we are, everything we've got, everything we're going to be. It's got to be surrendered to Him. And so that's why prayer has to be a daily thing. It's not just at meal times. And... Some people get awkward. I go out to eat with them, and they sit down, they grab that knife and fork, and man, they dig in, and they got a mouthful, and they look up, and they're staring at me. And I haven't picked up any of the utensils yet, and I'm looking at them. 
And so they finish chewing and they swallow and they go, oh, yeah, we're supposed to pray. But I'm not talking about just that kind of prayer. I'm talking about a prayer that's our life. It's who we are. It's what we are. It's more than getting in a circle and holding hands. And, and anybody prayed those prayers? And, you know, you pray out loud to you're through praying, then you squeeze the other guy's hand or gal's hand, and that's their signal to pray. And I remember as a kid, I was about 13 or 14, and it come my turn to pray, and I was scared to death, and I, I, I was stuttering and couldn't get the word out. And so they had just squeezed this hand. It's my turn to pray, so I just passed the squeeze on. I just squeezed their hand. And they started praying, and I went, whoo, they passed me by. I'm not talking about that kind of prayer. I'm talking about in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, where they had prayed. And the Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there, they were all in one accord, in one place. And wow, what happened? There appeared unto them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And the power of God fell upon them. Why? It was answer to prayer. And then in Acts chapter 3, there was a miracle. Two of the disciples were going up to pray. They were going to their prayer. And they came to the temple, and there was the blind man, the lame man, laying there. And he's lame, and he's begging alms. He was a preacher. He didn't have any money. And he said, I don't have no money. I don't have any silver and gold, but what I've got, I'm going to give you. And he reached down and took him by the hand and said, In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And what happened? He got up and he walked. And the Bible says he went into the temple and he was walking and leaping and praising God. Wow. How could that happen? They hadn't got to the prayer meeting, they hadn't got to the prayer service. But God was with them because they had a lifestyle of prayer. See, prayer's got to be more than just what we do at church. Prayer's got to be more than just going through some motion at church. Prayer has got to be a lifestyle. They were praying all the time, and especially... When we read in our text in Acts chapter 4, wow, they prayed. You, you, you read here in chapter 8, verse 4, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, and this is after a lame man was healed. Remember the lame man laying there at the gate? They're on their way into the temple. They prayed for him. He's healed. Now they're brought before the authorities. And he's filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man by what means he is made whole. In other words, well, I'm going to tell you how it happened to him. It wasn't me. Now watch him. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you all crucified whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. In other words, you crucified Jesus Christ, but God raised him up from the dead, and by his name, this lame man has been made whole. That's how it happened. It wasn't some hocus pocus. It wasn't some sleight of hand. It wasn't some trickery but here was a lame man but Jesus whom you knew and you crucified him but God raised him up from the dead now by his name who we've been praying to who we've been worshiping we've invoked his name 
And this man is standing here before you whole because of that name of Jesus. Wow. And then he goes on. He says, this is stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. In other words, this is the one that all the Jews have been looking for. Here he is. Neither is there salvation in any other, talking about Jesus Christ. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. In other words, he's saying it's in the name of Jesus Christ. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. That's how it happened. Come on, people. The miracles didn't happen because of Peter and John, but it was because of the name that they lifted up. It was because who they were glorifying. It's Jesus. So what did these people do? The very next verse. Now remember, these are the rulers of the people. The elders of Israel, watch them, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. Let me put it in today's vocabulary. They said, they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were idiots. You know, they said, look at these guys, they're just fishermen. They have no education. They haven't done anything for society. They're nothing that we would all want to be with. They're idiots. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. The difference was Jesus. The difference was Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. They couldn't tear it down because they had been with Jesus. And now they see the results of them being with Jesus is this man is healed. And they're thinking they're idiots. Watch them. And when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves. In other words... King James is trying to tell us that they put them outside and let's have a little private talk here. And let's figure out what we're going to do with these idiots. Because the very next verse says, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed is a notable miracle. It's been done by them. And everybody can see it. And we can't deny it. So what are we going to do? It says, we don't want it to spread no further among all the people. So we need to threaten them. We need to get upset with them and tell them they cannot speak anymore and mention that name of Jesus. So that's what they did. Watch it. Verse 18, they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Verse 19, but Peter and John, remember, they were bold. Watch what they said. They answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, they were saying, You tell us we can't do it. But man, i got to tell you, whether I'm going to listen to you, or I'm going to listen to God i got to do what God's told me to do. We're going to talk in Jesus' name. Now, let's read between the lines here. Don't go out and drive your car faster than the speed limit. And when you get pulled over, you whip the Scripture out. And you said, my preacher said... That I don't have to obey these laws. I can listen to God. God told me to go. They will not only write you a ticket. They're going to take you to jail. And they're going to examine your head. And be careful. That officer may know the word of God. And he'll just put the word back on you. And says, but the word says obey the laws of the land.
Where was I? Okay, the next verse. Verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all the men glorified God for that which was done. What were they glorifying God over? That man who was healed. The next verse. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. This man, see right, right there tells you, if you're 40 and up, you got it. You've arrived. If you hadn't got to 40 yet, you still need, no. I'm just. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all. So in other words, they went back to the church and they reported what all had happened. Now watch this. And when they heard that, this talk about the church, they heard this story that was just told them. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Somebody shout, yeah. yeah. You know what y'all just did? You lifted up your voice in one accord. That's what that means. You know, when they get up here and they're singing in unison, they're singing the same thing. And what we need to do as a church, one of the greatest things that can happen for you and for me is when somebody that knows how to pray, prays for you. I'm not talking about somebody just comes along and says, oh, okay, oh God, oh yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking about someone who comes. And they know the word, and they're walking in the authority of that word, and they claim that word, and they speak that word. And they know it's going to happen. That's why I like it. I'm walking through the church, talking to people, blessing people. And I, I, th there's people that pat me on the back and say things and this and that. And that's fine, good, I like it, keep it going, massage the back, yeah, help me out. But then there's other people that come up and they lay, lay their hand and they speak with authority and they speak with commandment and they lay their hand there and they say things like, I release the authority of the angels of heaven on you today. Or they lay, lay their hands, man, the power of God is on you. And they speak with authority and they speak that word of God. Wow. Something's happening. So when I, I was talking to the prayer meeting before church today and I told them one of the greatest things we can do when we pray is not just go, Lord, I thank you for all this, and you're good, and thank you, Jesus, and praise your name. And thank you. How many of y'all pray that way? You'll, oh, God, I pray. I got to see who's texting me. I got to see, I got to check, you know. I got to check the score, see what the Rangers' magic number is. And I'm checking up on the Cowboys, and I know I got to hurry because they have an early kickoff, and I don't want to hinder any of you, you know. So, now what we need, when Pastor Hayden or someone comes up here and, and they say, let's pray, we shouldn't just go, No, but we ought to do what they did right there. And I went and looked this week all through the Bible. Many times it speaks where they lifted up their voice. They raised their voice. They cried aloud. In other words, they prayed out loud. I'm not talking about where you have to start screaming and shouting and everybody quits praying and they start looking at you. See, then we're getting off and we're doing the wrong thing because we're bringing everything to us when it should be going to Him. But if we lift up our voice, I mean, pray out loud. Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. You are the author of my salvation. You are the first thing in my life. I love you. You are mighty. You have preserved me. You have kept me. You have blessed me. And for that, I give you praise. See, that's what has happened. 
That's what has to happen when we say, let's pray together. Everybody, we're not saying the same thing, but everybody starts praying out loud. You're not screaming and shouting, but you're praying out loud. Wow. And that's what happened here. And so it says that they raised their, they lifted their voice, or they raised their voice with one accord, and they said, Thou, Lord, Thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and sea and all that is within them. Watch it. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage? Now, you know what they're doing? They're going back to Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And they're quoting it. Psalm chapter 2 starts off this way. And it says, Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined vain things. And the kings of the earth stood up. And the rulers were gathered together. Except this time, they put in there who it was that those kings were raging about. Against the Lord. Against His Christ. For of a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. In other words, they were saying, Lord, help us. We got all this coming against us. But we're going to pray the Word of God. And we're going to hold you accountable. We're going, you said you would do this. You said this would happen. Watch this. The Bible says if one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. So when we come together as a church and one is here, you know, a small group last night with our exchange group. There was a small group. There was 18 of us gathered there together. It's a much smaller group than here. But look how much we put the flight. But now here today, there's a whole lot more than 18. And you look here. So how much more can we put the flight? One, a thousand. Two, ten thousand. What can six, seven hundred or more put to flight? Wow. That's why when we say, let's pray together, we ought to say, wow, I'm coming boldly before the throne of grace according to Hebrews 4, 16. I'm going to come boldly and I'm going to make my declaration. Wow. You know what I feel right now? I feel like every one of us. Let's just, right there, just raise your hand. And let's take about 15 seconds. And let's just start, man, Let's put him on the run. If one's putting 10,000 to flight, how much more are we right now? Off your business, off your family, off your health. Uh, devil, you got to go. But in the name of Jesus, Lord, I invoke your mercy, your power, your glory. Bless this place. Touch this people. Anoint right now. We bless your name. We praise your name. We give you glory. You are the mighty God. You are the everlasting Father. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. All right, all right. You may be seated. I love that. I have to get you all to quit praying. Most churches, they say that, and they pray for three seconds, and it's over. Y'all just getting warmed up. Wow, I like it. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 9. Nehemiah did that. He started quoting the scripture. And he, he was quoting 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And he was saying, You said if we sin, Lord, but if we turn to you, that you would be a blessing to us. And so he's reminding him of his word. Folks, when you pray, you need to pray the Word of God. And you need to remind God what He said He would do. If we will, He will. And so I want to hold God accountable. I'm saying, Lord, you told me if I'd submit myself to you, James 4, 7, if I submit myself to you, resist the devil, the devil's got to get out of here. So, Lord, I'm praying that right now. I'm praying that. And so when they 
prayed together and they prayed the scripture, it brought power. The Bible says, verse 31, there in Acts 4, that the place where they were was shaken. In our old building one time, we had such a powerful prayer meeting, I thought the whole building was shaking. I thought there was an earthquake. I jumped up, ran outside the building, and looked to see if the foundation moved. It says the place was shaken. An earthquake. Sirens are going off. They're all reporting it on, on radio and television. Earthquake hit Dallas. No, that was Dallas First Church praying. It'll create energy. It'll create synergy. James chapter 5, verse 16. Toward the end of that verse, it says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's also a righteous woman. But now watch this. Now, don't send me emails about the gender thing when I said that. But when it's talking about man, that's mankind. So that's man and woman. All right. Just thought I'd throw that in there. So I went and looked up what is an effectual, fervent prayer. Effectual is achieving. So your prayer is achieving. It's believing. It's conceiving. And I looked up the word fervent, zealous. Another translation says it was white, hot, boiling over. So the achieving, white hot, boiling over prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So what kind of prayers are you praying? I, I'm putting the word here. James said that effectual fervent prayer, that achieving, white hot, boiling over prayer. Oh, Lord, I pray that you just heal this guy right now. There's times to pray quiet, but then there's some times. I'm not talking about where you just shake their head till you know, they get a crick in their neck. Or you just shake them. I remember as a little kid, I was about seven or eight years old, nine years old in church, and way back then, this is the early 60s, and they had, sometimes they had their hair piled up on top of their head, and wow, all kinds of things was up in there. <laughs> and I saw a preacher, he was praying for a lady, and she started shaking, and he kept shaking that head until that hairdo started going like that, and we kids were after going, it's getting ready to go. It's getting ready to go. And we were doing play-by-play -play like, like they do, you know. He's at the 30. He's at the 40. He's going to go all the way. And we're sitting there, and we're going, it's getting ready to go. It's getting ready. There, there it goes. And, man, that... Bam! It all come down, bobby pins flying everywhere, and there was something up in there. I didn't know what it was. It looked like a rat. It come flying out of there, and it landed on the ground. It hopped around. I jumped up, run up, start stepping on it. I thought, I better kill this thing. I'm not talking about that kind of prayer. But I'm talking about a prayer that's more than just your heart's not in it. You don't really believe it. You don't really expect it. You know, when they were praying for the lame man in Acts 4, they didn't just go over there, if you feel like it, if you want to, go ahead. If you feel better, please, pretty please, get up. No, they went over there and said, Hey, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I'm giving it to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. I don't know what happened. Just like when you're baptized and buried in the name of Jesus. That's just water from Dallas. But something happens and the blood of Jesus is applied and sins are washed away and the Holy Ghost comes in and people begin to speak with the Holy Ghost power. Wait a minute. So when he said that in the name of Jesus, just like in water baptism, now it's healing. And something happened to that man because they believed what they were praying. 
I don't want us praying some little milly mouth prayer, you know, just doing our thing, putting in our time, going through our motions. You know, when we were playing sandlot ball and we would pick teams, whether it was basketball, football, or baseball, I wanted somebody, if they were going to bat, I wanted them to have, I'm going to hit the ball. I don't want somebody up there just swinging. I mean, if I'm going to shoot the ball, it's going in the hole, baby. I mean, my twin brother and I, we wasn't called the flying tees for nothing. Because on basketball court, baby, we could, yeah, mm -hmm, I know white men can't jump, but baby, we could jump. I remember last time I played basketball. 13 years ago. And I played a 15-year-old. And it was one-on-one. -on -one. And I had on slick sole shoes, suit, coat, tie, everything. I thought, I'm getting ready to school this boy. I mean, this bad boy, he, I'm going to put him under. Ooh, the coat come off, the tie came down. I mean, he was up by four. You had to win by two, and we were close to ten. I said, uh-huh, we getting ready to go downtown. It was the hardest. But when I finally won, I walked off the court, and I said, it's over, baby. <laughs> From now on, I'll coach. I mean... When I play, I want somebody on my team that's going to play. That's why on my staff, I want people that are going to do it. I want somebody doing something. I want somebody that's not just going to come set and not do it. I, come on, somebody. And so if you're going to pray, I mean, let's go back to the Bible and let's get in there what is, and let's believe it. If we can believe it, and conceive it, we will achieve it. Wow. So pray like that with focus. John 15, 5. He, the Word says, remain in me or abide in me. He said, abide in me, live in me, remain in me. So in other words, he's saying we're praying all the time. I've had people tell me, well, prayer is my quiet time. I thought quiet time was when you got in trouble. And mama put you in the corner. Prayer's my quiet time. Or prayer's my time out. No, prayer's a lifestyle. I like to read Smith Wigglesworth. And he said, I never pray for more than 20 minutes. I like that. But he also said... I never pray for more than 20 minutes, but I never go 20 minutes without praying. So in other words, prayer becomes a lifestyle. I'm walking down the hallway in, in the office, and I'll be singing my praises to God. Or I'll be praying out loud. You pray. That's why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and Acts 12 and 5. Pray without ceasing. And prayer without ceasing was made. It's a lifestyle. We're always talking to God. Now, re real quick, it's got to become our priority. I like to pray early in the morning. This morning, knowing what I was going to preach today, I was so pumped up about it last night, I couldn't go to sleep. And I finally, sleep came. It was last time I looked at my phone, it was 12.23. And I said, I'm not going to set alarm. Lord, I'm ready to go. So when I wake up, I'll wake up, I'll be ready. 20 to 5, I'm wide awake. And I said, man, i got to go back to sleep. I'm a, I hadn't been asleep long. And he whispered in my ear, get up, I won't talk to you. And I went, oh, Lord, let me sleep a little longer. 
he raised his voice. Get up. I want to talk to you. So I'm getting up, stumbling around. It took me about 20 minutes, but now I'm down in the den at 5 o'clock. I've got a few of the lights on, and I said, Lord, I'm here. Talk to me. He started talking to me. When you make it a priority. Wow. Wow. It's like paying your tithe. It's your first thing you do. First, the first ten. The, the first fruits. The, there you go. And that's what you ought to do with prayer. It's first. But you know what most people do? We wait till we get in trouble. We wait till the bank's calling. Or we wait till the doctor is calling. Or we wait till we're locked up. We wait till there's problems. Why don't we flip that around? Why don't we reverse that? Instead of waiting for trouble to pray, why don't we pray now so when trouble comes, we're already tanked up. We already got... Come on. Try to go get money out of the bank when you ain't got no money in the bank. When you got money in the bank, they're going to give you more money. Hello? Come on, somebody. Give it to God. So that's a priority. Then we need a place. A place. First prayer room I ever saw in a house was way back in the 90s when Ben and Dolores Garcia had me come to their new home. And they wanted me to pray over it. So I go there to pray over it. And as I'm praying over it, they showed me their prayer room. They built the home so they had a stained glass window in their prayer room. Good God of glory. They had an altar in there. There was no other furniture. It was a prayer room. So we need a place to pray. It needs to be a private place. I call it a prayer place. I've got several of them. One of my favorites, my truck. Pray while I'm driving. That's, I, I do that all the time. How many times God will talk to me and I'm driving the car or the truck. And then I say, well, I got a text. And they'll get on to me for texting and driving. I've had people honking at me, shaking their finger. And I'll pull over and say, yeah, well, then you know, I need not to do that. You know, when you're young, you can tell your kids. Don't do that. But when your kids grow up, and then they're telling you, Dad, you shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> I like to pray outside. I got a place outside, that patio with that pergola. Is that what it is that you built? Our HUD built? And I go out there and pray. I like that, or I pray down in the den. You also need a plan, a disciple's prayer, or that uh, tabernacle prayer. But here, as I close, we need to remember, and, and it's another P word, and that is person. Our prayer is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about anybody else. It's a conversation with Jesus about Jesus. 2 Corinthians 13 and 14, it's the closing verses of those two books of the Bible. Watch it. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Notice three things there. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus. Wow. I can't think of grace without that old song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. Wow. That amazing grace of my master, Jesus Christ, and the cross he went to. Oh, Lord, i got to talk to you about that. That's Hebrews chapter 4. I can come boldly before the throne of grace. But then he said, not only the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the love of God. When I think of the love of God, the extravagance of God's love, where he reached down and found me. He found me in my sin. He found me in my condition. He found 
found me when I had no friend. He found me when I had no hope. And so I've got to submit to him. I've got to make sure that extravagant love of God, I'm under him. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, For this cause I bow my knee. For this cause I submit to him. He's under me. Or I'm under him. He's over me. Somebody shout, he's over me. He's over me. Then it says, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. That's the intimate friendship of God Almighty. <laughs> the Comforter is with us. Wow. The word worship and the word fear are used interchangeably all through the Bible. Because worship and fear are a lot alike. Wow, they're both awestruck. They're both respectful, honoring. And when it says the fear of the Lord, it's talking about how you honor God, how you respect God. And it's all in that worship. You know, when Hayden was a kid, he didn't care where the cereal came from. He just wanted it. And he'd go to the pantry and get it. He didn't care where the milk come from just as long as he opened the refrigerator and it was there. It didn't bother him. Hey, I'm a rub-a-dub-dub, man. I'm ready for some grub. He's hungry. And that boy could eat. Now, I'm looking around. Hey, didn't you bring me in a cereal today? <laughs> Dad, that's my cereal. <laughs> Dad, that's my milk. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. What I'm saying is, you have a heavenly Father. Why don't we act like it? He had a Father. He didn't have to worry about where the milk came from. He didn't have to worry about where the cereal come from. He didn't have to worry about where the next meal was. No, he just knew he had a dad that was going to provide. Hey, I have a heavenly father. You have a heavenly father. Why are we sitting around worrying about where it's all coming from? We ought to be praising God and living in such a way Come on, somebody. He's got healing for you. He's got deliverance for you. He's got joy for you. He's here to help you. He's the intimate friend. In other words, he's our partner. He's not just our dad. He's not just our father. But he's our partner. Some of the worst sins of the church is not doing what we shouldn't do. Some of the worst sins of the church is not doing what we should do. James 4.17 says, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. So what about your marriage? What about your business? What about your family? What about your relationships? What about your ministry? What about your health? Let's put it in God's hands. Let's give it to Him. Let's surrender. So our heads are bowed and the eyes are closed. God is speaking to hearts right now. I know I've gone long today, but God is talking to all of us. You're not here just by accident or coincidence. God knew you were going to be here, and he knew the message that he had given me to speak today. And God's talking to you. Have you surrendered everything to Jesus Christ? So that your prayer life is not hindered? So that your prayer life... I'm not talking about praying an hour a day. I'm talking about taking a few minutes. And then having that lifestyle to where it's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God's going to bless you with all this other. As we submit to him, 
he blesses. Lord, I pray for this people right now. God, I know we have guests.